Good evening, everyone. Uh, it really is an honor to be here with you at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. I'm going to remember uh, for Friday night at Cary. And every time I begin a talk or begin a reading, uh, Walt Whitman comes to mind. And these two lines from Walt Whitman are often here. And I'm wondering if you might know them. The untold want. Does anyone know those lines? The untold want by life and land never granted. Now, voyager, sail thou forth to seek and find. Every place I visit, every reading or talk I give feels like a new voyage of discovery because of the people I meet, the dialogues we engage in, and because of the new landscapes encountered. Uh, this is not a new landscape, but it's good to return to it after many years. So I want to extend deep gratitude to Lori Quillen for inviting me, and to Josh Ginsberg, to Pam Freeman, to Aaron Frick, one of my former students, uh, to David Fisher, Olivia Van Mellencamp, and to Catherine Forbes, and to all who joined together to create this public forum. And of course, my deep gratitude goes to all of you for coming and welcoming me. My book, Trace, began in a struggle to answer or at least come to terms with questions that have long haunted me. Questions like these. If each of our lives is an instant, like a camera shutter that opens and closes, what can we make of our place in the world, of that latent image for the instant we have? And then, over time and space, what do generations of instants mean? The struggle to face these questions grew to become a mosaic of personal journeys and historical inquiry that crossed the continent and time to explore how this nation's still unfolding history has marked the American land has marked the society and has marked me. And it's taken me from twisted terrain within the San Andreas fault zone to a South Carolina plantation. From an island in Lake Superior and the stories that were imposed there to Indian territory in what is now Oklahoma and the black towns established there before and after the Civil War. Yet also from national parks to burial grounds to the names that the American land wears and the origins of these names. And from the US-Mexico border to the US Capitol and the origins of both. In all, Trace counters some of our oldest and most damaging public silences by revealing often unrecognized connections, such as the sighting of Washington, D.C. and the economic motives of slavery. None of these links is coincidental. Too few appear in public history, yet they all touch us. So what I'd like to do is offer the prologue to the book and excerpts from a chapter that speaks to the intersection of ecological awareness and social responsibility. And it tells you some of my own path toward understanding, a path that began in childhood through an alien land toward a land ethic. So the prologue begins with thoughts on a frozen pond. And then the chapter that I'll read, uh, moving from an alien land, and that's my father, to a land ethic. And I know many of you know this gentleman, Aldo Leopold. This chapter is a little bit different, and most of the other chapters consider history in the land. But I thought it would be good to introduce you to me 
and to why I came to this book. And so first, let me offer the prologue. After today, I think all of you would think that we're about to enter winter. Uh, and so what I'm about to read, I think, is apropos to the time. Not quite able to do it now, but I'd say by late December, early January, it will be possible. Prologue, Thoughts on a Frozen Pond. In the dead of winter, I like to walk on water. Held above liquid depths of the nearby lake by a vast frozen plain, this ice demands respect. I look again, listen again, attentive to any crack or yielding to my weight. When the surface is more solid than a hardwood dance floor and much thicker, I venture far. Even then, I hear the gloop, a distant whoop, a muffled gloosh water undulating beneath ice and me. Sunlight appears to emanate from above and below on cloudless February days, rang through the crystalline lattice underfoot. With my eyes but inches from the surface, any sense of depth of refracted distance yields to a sense of motion arrested. Air bubbles halt in mid-ascent. White oak leaves descend as if on invisible steps, suspended for a season above the lake bottom. The recent past lies beneath me in these marcescent leaves, plucked and blown here by January's heavy winds. Inches away, they are out of reach because I kneel within the next stratum. Thoughts of time's passage always come to mind on such walks. Thoughts of how memory of any form becomes inscribed in the land. The hills surrounding this lake and my home are worn remains of long vanished mountains. Glacial debris from the last ice age produces a rock crop in my garden each and every spring. And stone walls that two centuries ago bordered fields and pastures now thread the dark heart of forests. Lauren Isley wrote in his book, The Immense Journey, that human beings are denied the dimension of time, so rooted are we in our particular now. We cannot in person step backward or forward from our circumscribed pinpoints. I cannot touch a leaf encased in ice, nor can I feel the calloused hands that once stacked these walls. Yet we make our lives among relics and ruins of former times and former worlds. And each of us is, too, a landscape inscribed by memory and by loss. I've long felt estranged from time and place, uncertain of where home lies. My skin, my eyes, my hair recall the blood of three continents as the paths of ancestors, free and enslaved Africans, yes, but also colonists from Europe and peoples indigenous to this land converge within me. But I've known little of them or their paths to my present. Though I can track long bygone moments on this continent from rocks and fossils, those remnants of deep time, the traces of a more intimate lineal past have seemed hidden and lost. Yet to live in this country is to be marked, marked by its still unfolding history, life marks that are seen and unseen. 
From my circumscribed pinpoint, I must try to trace what has marked me. The way traverses many forms of memory and silence of a people as well as a single person. And because our lives take place among the shadows of unnumbered years, the journey has to cross America and time. Come with me. We may find that home lies in remembering, in piecing together the fragments left, and in reconciling what it means to inhabit terrains of memory and to be one. Trace, noun, a way or path, a course of action, footprint or track, vestige of a former presence, an impression, a minute amount, a life mark. Trace, verb, to make one's way, to pace or step, to travel through, to discern, to mark or draw, to follow tracks or footprints, to pursue, to discover. The chapter Alien Land Ethic, A Distance Between, uh, begins with a child's questioning, a child's questioning that set the, the course of the journey that led to this book. And as I mentioned before, it is a, a different type of chapter. The other chapters consider places, history, and marks. But in many ways, this is the chapter that sets the framework. And I thought you might want to know a little bit more about me and how I came to the journey. So I'd like to read a couple of excerpts from it, please. When I was a horse, a wild Appaloosa full of speed, I'd run fast, up and down sidewalks, around playgrounds in our yard, just to feel wind rush with me. But when the world moved beyond sense in the late 1960s, I began to run from what I feared. Riots near our new home in Washington, D.C. left burnt, gutted remains of buildings I knew. The war in Vietnam joined us for dinner each and every night as TV footage of wounded soldiers, of crying women and children, of places with names like Kaesan, Milai, and assassinations of men my parents called good men meant that anyone, my parents, my friends, or I could disappear at any time. I learned by the age of eight that hate could be spit dripping down the front of my favorite homemade dress. Hate could be a classmate sing song. Never saw nothing as ugly as a nigger. Never saw nothing as crummy as a nigger. His eyes on me. I began to run, not just to feel wind, but in hope it would blow away whatever it was about me that was bad and hate-deserving. Safety lived in my room, in my mother's arms, and outdoors in nature that never judged or spat. Does your child mind haunt you too? I began to understand in two teenage encounters with books by authors who also seemed to be seeking, and I met them question to question. My entering ninth grade class had to read four books over the summer beforehand. I don't remember the fourth, 
but man's search for meeting by Viktor Frankl, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullers, and The Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold struck me deeply. I kept those books, returning to them again and again over the years. That Leopold's 1949 book was hailed as landmark or a famous, almost holy book in conservation circles, I knew nothing about. What appealed to my 14-year-old sensibilities were intimate images of land and seasons in place, and atoms recycling odyssey through time. The chickadees, so small a bundle of large enthusiasms. The cranes call as the trumpet in the orchestra of evolution. But what also appealed was the seeming openness of this man's struggle to frame a personal truth. In his last essay, The Land Ethic, Aldo Leopold enlarged the human community's boundaries to include soil, water, plants, animals, or collectively, the land. Though I couldn't find words then, his call for an extension of ethics to earth relations writ large seemed to express a sense of responsibility and reciprocity not yet embraced by this country, but embedded in many indigenous traditions of experience. That the land is fully inhabited, intimate with immediate presence. These ideas prompted many new questions. If, as Mr. Leopold wrote, and these are his words, obligations have no meaning without conscience, and the problem we face is the extension of the social conscience from people to land, end quote, then what part of this nation still lack conscience broad enough to realize an internal change of mind and heart, to embrace what he called both evolutionary possibility and ecological necessity. Why? And why was it in the United States that I knew at age 14 that human relations could be so cruel? What I wanted more than anything was to speak with Mr. Leopold, to ask him. I so feared that his we and us in the book excluded me and other Americans with ancestral roots in Africa or Asia or Native America. Only uncertainty and estrangement felt within my teenage reach. I found another book that was published in 1949 by accident in the basement stacks of my university library at the end of my first year there. The author, Willard Savoy. The title, Alien Land. This was my father, dead ten, almost two years. This was a book he never told me about and was written years before he met my mother and well more than a decade and a half before my birth. And it is an account of an embittered multiracial boy becoming a man who thinks for a time that he might escape racial prejudice and his own demons by redefining himself as white. Because in the language of the day, my father with his blue eyes and golden hair and very light skin, could pass if he wanted to. The alien land he wrote about came from what he called, and these are his words, the hypocrisy which in one breath preached the doctrine that all men were created free and equal, and in the very next breath denied to millions the simple respect which should naturally go with such a belief. In the basement stack that night, I opened it and read the dedication. 
and it alone convinced me that there possibly was a chance for dialogue after death. And these are the words. To the child whom I may someday have, and to the children of each American in the fervent hope that at least one shall be brought to see more clearly the enduring need for simple humanity. We all know that a child born today enters a world of rapid and extensive change, and the list is often repeated. Ecosystems around the world have never before been so fragmented or degraded, resulting in great losses to the diversity of life. Fossil hydrocarbons literally fueled industrial revolutions and the mechanization of food production. And because of this fossil fuel economy, greenhouse gas levels continue to climb, exceeding the highest atmospheric concentrations since our species evolved. We all know this. The pace and degree of such environmental changes are unprecedented in human history. Yet, the embedded systems and norms behind them in the United States, the most energy consumptive nation, are not. Their deep roots allowed and continue to amplify fragmented ways of seeing, valuing, and using nature as well as human beings. Consider the ecological footprint. Commonly described as a sustainability indicator, its estimate can mask how exploitations of land and exploitations of people are intertwined. Quantifying the area of productive land and water needed to provide ecosystem services or resources that are used, like clean water, food, fuel, and the waste gen generated, gives only a partial measure of the biosphere's regenerative capacity. And by this measure alone, humanity's footprint is already excessive. But American prosperity and progress have come at great human cost, too. Forced removals of the continent's indigenous peoples yielded land to newcomers from Europe and their descendants. And the New Republic's economy grew upon a foundation of industrial agriculture built and powered by enslaved workers, north as well as south. Consuming other people's labor, dispossessing other people of land and life connection to it, devaluing human rights and diminishing one's community, autonomy, and health. These are not just events of the past. In a still globalizing world, American agribusiness giants like ConAgra have profited from the products of enslaved labor in Brazil at a seemingly safe moral distance. And far too many degraded environments in the United States are also citizens' homes. In nearly all states with hazardous waste facilities, high percentages of people of color and the economically poor live and die next to those sites. And witness too, farm workers in pesticide-laden fields whose health and lives are rarely considered as a cost of producing cheap food. A wiser measure of the ecological footprint would include people, or at least their labor. It might factor in the losses of relationships with land or home, losses of self-determination, losses of health, losses of life. What if the footprint measured over time upon whom 
and what this nation's foot has trod. That is, who has paid for prosperity? Alien land, land ethic. What is the distance between them? Consider these words by E.O. Wilson. He wrote, and these are his words, our troubles arise from the fact that we do not know what we are and cannot agree on what we want to be. The primary cause of this intellectual failure is ignorance of our origins. He continues, humanity is part of nature, a species that evolved among other species. The more closely we identify ourselves with the rest of life, the more quickly we will be able to discover the sources of human sensibility and acquire the knowledge on which an enduring ethic, a sense of preferred direction can be built. Can you imagine an even larger preferred sense of direction. As an adolescent becoming a young adult, I felt removed from an integrity or wholeness of living because so much of my acquired knowledge came from inculcated divisions. And only slowly did I learn that I would remain complicit in my own diminishment unless I stepped out of the separate trap. You from me, us from them, brown skin from deep pigmented skin, relations among people from relations with the land, waters, and atmosphere. Another pre-ninth grade summer text was Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, a survivor of Auschwitz and other Nazi camps who became a leading psychiatrist in post-war Europe. I became, at age 14, obsessed by the last two sentences of his book, and these are his words. Our generation is realistic for we have come to know man as he really is. After all, man is that being who has invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who has entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Yisrael on his lips. Frankel believed that in his words, each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. And he added, and again, these are his words, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, and thus evoke his will to meaning from its state of latency. What did Frankel's words of choice mean for a 14-year-old girl, for her, my generation? Could one choose between ignorance and innocence in such a world? In the passing years, I began to doubt any emergence from a state of latency, doubted whether Americans as a whole could choose to answer these questions broadly. What and whom do you love and respect? To what and whom are you responsible, obligated? These questions have stayed with me since I was a teenager. 
and they are questions I've heard many asking and answering in the past year and a half, in recent months, weeks, and days across the nation and in the nation's capital. What and whom do you love and respect? To what and whom are you responsible, obligated? Respect comes from the Latin for the willingness to look again and again and again with assumptions put aside, respect. Responsible, meaning the ability to respond, the capacity to attend, to stand behind one's acts. In conscience comes from the Latin for a joint knowledge or feeling, to come to know together. Fourteen years before a Sand County Almanac and Alien Land went to press, in a decade defined by the Depression and the Dust Bowl, Aldo Leopold and his family began to restore abandoned, worn-out farmland along the Wisconsin River near Baraboo. They planted native prairie grasses, wildflowers, shrubs, and eventually thousands of trees. This was the Sand County whose seasonal cycles of life and death the almanac celebrated. And this was land that felt both familiar and welcoming one recent October dawn when I took a worn path to that river's edge to watch the sun rise over the downstream horizon. The gift of time by these waters came from the Aldo Leopold Foundation. And on the Wisconsin River's sand plain, my adolescent questions met the clearest yet responses. I could imagine it possible to refrain from disintegrated thinking and living, from a fragmented understanding of human experience on this continent. I could imagine it possible to refuse what alienates and separates, to see in fugitive pieces the forces that have shaped this land and shaped ourselves in it. But of course, there's always the danger of fooling myself. Yet if it is possible, then perhaps a larger sense of who we are as interconnected ecological, cultural, and historical beings could begin to grow. For if, as Aldo Leopold believed, the health of the land writ large is its capacity for self-renewal, then the health of the human family could, in part, be an intergenerational capacity for locating ourselves within many inheritances. As citizens of the land, as citizens of nations, even within this nation, and as citizens of Earth. For real democracy, I believe, lies in ever-widening communities. Questioned by life, we are all held to account. All the Leopold and my father never met in their lifetimes. I want alien land and a land ethic to meet and answer to each other in ours. Thank you. So I believe that uh, we can have time for questions, conversation. And as I said, this was the unusual chapter. The other ones concern uh, 
the origin of names on the land, the origins of Washington, D.C., the wall along the border with Mexico, uh, and also how this history has marked the land as well as each of us and myself. So I gave you a part of Trace that really was the basis, the beginning, the child who had to understand. And this book is one of those attempts to come to terms with the struggle to understand. So I'd also be glad to read excerpts from those other parts if you wanted that too. But questions? <laughs> that sounds like a leading question. <laughs> Is it loaded? <laughs> I actually, I actually am. I, I worked with a publisher, and they, they offered a cover, as publishers often will, uh, that had nothing, I shouldn't say that, uh, that did not present what I wanted, what the, ba the book's pages tried to do. And so they had hired a designer, a freelancer, and she and I worked together. I told her what I was thinking of. And one of the key elements uh, about the past being present is the idea of palimpsest or palimpsest, depending on how you present it. That a surface that you see today can be erased, it can be effaced, it can be almost entirely weathered and eroded away, yet not fully. That there are traces of what was there before. And so when we talk back and forth about it, this was an idea she came up with. The leaf at this time of year, weathering, decaying, yet behind it. So I actually, I do like it. <laughs> oh, good, all right, all right, thank you. I was worried. <laughs> okay. Yes, oh, yes, you, I, think, I think people need to have the microphone too. We'll pass it around. We'll pass it around. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much. I don't want to like put myself in your shoes, but maybe you have been in my shoes. I can't tell you, or maybe I can tell you how much it means to see someone who looks like me giving a presentation like this in a place like this and using terms that perhaps have different meaning, um, especially the word pass and the concept of that. My question is that what is the role and the power of institutions to form these connections. A few years ago, I was at the Chicago Field Museum and they had unearthed um, statues that had basically been created to try to draw differences between different phenotypes and claim that we were different kinds of human, maybe less human than others. And you mentioned trace and touching and rubbing. The statues were restored after kind of being left in the halls of the Field Museum for people to rub and to touch. And they placed these in context and restored them and took ownership for mistakes, specifically mistakes that science has made. And I've yet to see another organization or field do that. I think in many ways you've answered your question uh, with that example. I think it, it, it comes to facing what's uncomfortable, what if you've seen Al, Gore, Al Gore's uh, film in Inconvenient Truth. It's, it's facing all the inconvenient truths that would have us reconsider origin stories uh, about who this nation uh, has been and what has happened to make it. Many of the stories, um, let me just jump back a sec. Um, often when people think of history, they think of history as the events that happened in the past. Uh, but history as we learn it, because none of us existed or lived in 1890 or in 1860 or 1720, what we know are the stories that are told about what happened. And those stories leave many silences. They're biased. They're based on the agenda of the storyteller. And if we don't face the underpinnings, that is the seemly underside of what we know about ourselves, then we can't really move forward. So the Chicago Museum, that's a great example of not trying to hide something by pushing it aside, oh, we can't talk about that, but actually talking about it and making it a forum for, in many ways, a sense of truth and reconciliation. 
because reconciliation won't happen until the truth is told. So it's a great example. So thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, and I think the, the, the woman behind you has a question. Unfortunately, I've seen some on a small scale, but not a large scale like that, not yet. I, I would say that the Smithsonian Institution is very much trying to do that, especially with the new um, museum, both the Museum of African American History and Culture and the Museum of the American Indian. They are very much doing it. Uh, but many visitors choose not to go to those museums. They go to the Museum of American History. And so even that museum is trying to have broader, more complicated stories and not the, the usual stories told by the usual suspects. But at the same time, by the same token, there are still venues that hold on and hold on very hard. Um, for example, uh, museums or public offerings of plantations in the South, they will not, and many of them do not even mention slavery or even mention how a 3,000 acre plantation became profitable. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, for example, the South Carolina plantation, and that's one of the chapters in the book, uh, after going on the public tour, I uh, visited uh, the cemetery and uh, the grounds uh, of the cemetery of the landowners, beautifully laid out, beautifully preserved, headstones and footstones, marble, marble carved, lovely. But then in walking back from that graveyard, I just noticed out in the wood that there were fist-sized rocks, like stepping stones, spread out into the woods. There was no word on them or what they were, but I learned that there were more than uh, 128 of them, and they were some of the people who had been enslaved and who had died within a short period of time. And their voices, their presence was completely erased. And South Carolina school standards, um, they have a virtual field trip that goes to this particular plantation, and on that virtual field trip for kindergarten through eighth grade, they define terms, and they define a plantation as a large farm worked by resident workers. Uh, yeah. And so if you're a school child who is interested in farming, interested, wouldn't you want to work on a plantation? Because I'd want to live there on that farm. It's hiding in plain sight what doesn't want to be admitted. So thank you for asking. I just wanted to ask you uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on, on the Native American background. Is that you have some Native American yes. background? And how did you discover that and, and what it means to you? Because a lot of us from all different races have traces of the Native American, and many of us don't know exactly what those histories are, but you know, you can hear people say, oh, I have Cherokee blood, <laughs> you know? But I think it unites us in some ways, but there's so much mystery there, and I wonder how your process was, and if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that background. I'll try to make this really brief, because this is a subject of my current book project. Uh, and it's essentially considering or expanding on the last chapter in Trace, which considers the origin of, of the nation's capital and the economic motives of slavery, because I learned that my father's people lived there even prior to the establishment of the capital in 1800, when it was open for business, um, the, uh, the act that enacted or began the building of the capital was in 1790, uh, the Residence Act. Uh, I learned that my father's people lived there. I learned that he was of multiracial heritage. Uh, I was not told anything by his family, and certainly not by him. So it's by digging into records, by going to county courthouses, by picking up musty ledger books that are about yay big, that when you open them, <laughs> and then the dust pours out. And then it's from finding in those records papers uh, like, uh, and it angers me even just to think about this, but certificates of freedom of, of people, some of whom never were enslaved, but they had to prove that they were free because the assumption was if you're a person of color who showed 
any trace of African ancestry or indigenous ancestry. This is in the colonial Chesapeake, Virginia, Maryland. The assumption was you were enslaved until you could prove otherwise. Um, and so it's finding that it's in, it's in the early colonial settling uh, after Jamestown in Virginia and Maryland where the convergence of my father's people, both um, those who came enslaved, but also free people um, who were of African ancestry, as well as English and Irish settlers, and as well as the indigenous people in that land, like the Rappahannock. Uh, so it's a convergence that began um, more than 200 years ago, or at this point, 300 years ago. And the new project is using the lens of my search for my father's family to understand the establishment of ideas about race, because in many ways, Virginia is ground zero. That is where the distinction, be white became white, and everyone else was shoved off to the side. Um, and it's also where the nation's capital was established and not coincidentally there. So it's understanding or looking at the place of race and the history of that through the lens of my search for my own past. Great, thank you for asking. Anyone else? Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about uh, reading Aldo Leopold um, for the first time. And so the way that I'm asking the question is, it strikes me that, you know, um, thinking as an historian and then thinking ecologically, I can see that these go together fluidly, but I think also that there can be a boundary line there that's important, but it can be kind of fractured. What's the boundary line? Um, between thinking as an historian or a humanist uh -huh. and then thinking as an ecologist and well, thinking about the total ecological system. So when you first read Leopold, how did this feel to you? Did it feel like tense and hopeful, like I hope he knows that he's talking about me or us? Or did it feel like it gave you the space to think and breathe and think about how the history of your family fits into a wider sphere? Well, at that point, I wasn't even thinking about the history of my family uh, because we didn't talk about race. I, I re was really trying to understand what race meant at that time because my father, um, for all intents and purposes, um, was primarily Anglo-American and looked at my mother, richer, darker skin than mine, dark, um, dark eyes, black eyes. And there were members in my immediate family who looked like many of you in this room, uh, and so I didn't understand race. I thought people came in all colors because, I mean, don't other animals do that? Um, it was only after we moved to Washington, D.C., and I was spat on and began mm -hmm. to understand that I could be hated for looking like this, um, that I began to wonder why, why. So at 14, reading a Sand County Almanac, I mean, getting beyond the Almanac, which I loved. I loved the, the seasonal because I love to pay attention to what was happening through time, picking a space and understanding how it changes, who migrated through, who stayed, uh, just what the textures of the land were over time. Oh, I love that. But when I got to the land ethic, that's when I read it and began to read something that art began to articulate questions that had been vague, ill-formed, I, but I couldn't nail them. And so, yes, I felt hopeful, yet at the same time, I thought, he's excluding me. Uh, because if you read the land ethic, those of you who know it well, you know it opens with the consideration of Odysseus returning home and hanging the quote unquote slave women. That's the only mention of slavery, because I hadn't read any of his other work at that point. And I thought, well, there's slavery in this country. Why aren't you talking about that? And then there's an, uh, an excerpt in there where he refers to um, that, uh, I don't remember the context, but he refers to a dead Chinaman. And that really struck me too. And so I 
I was so wanting to grasp, yes, you are helping me understand, yet you're not thinking about me, or for some reason I'm not part of this. And I couldn't come up with answers then. So the line that you, that you described, it was a different type of line for a teenager. It was a line of, please help me understand versus exclusion. And I didn't know which was which. And, but as an adult, coming back to it, I, I don't really see it as a line. I see it as two threads that can be interwoven. And it's that interweaving um, it can make many different tapestries, many different different textures, and that's what I much appreciate about his writing now, because I've read much more since I read that as a as a child. Okay. Did that answer? Okay, thank you. Hi. Yes. Hello. So um, I think a lot these days about how challenging it must be to be a 14 year old or a young person, and. Um, I wonder if you were speaking to a 14-year-old girl today, um, what you would talk with her about that would allow her to trace a path towards hope around her relationship with the land and with other people. That's a, it's a great question, and I don't think there would be a single answer. I think it would, um, and I, I'm not trying to jump away from the question, but I think it would depend on, on, on the teenager, on the, the child, as well as the circumstance, um, the situation, um, and what she or he is afraid of. And it would begin with the fear. What is it that, that not just keeps you up at night, but <laughs> that makes you question your existence? Because I began questioning um, whether or not I was supposed to be alive. Because I couldn't see myself in, in school um, lessons. Uh, what I was taught were lies, uh, or let's say twists and silences that left no room for people like my family. And so I would begin with that, with, with what is concerning that, that young person, and then take it from there. I think the biggest thing that I could do is to listen, and to hold out the hand and the heart, and to share stories, but I wouldn't arrive with an answer um, no, I would need to know what, what's most important to her or to him. Yeah. But I, and I have, to answer your question, not, not 14, but 10. And this 10-year-old girl is very much afraid, very much afraid. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yep, the, it's coming to you. Oh. Okay, next one. Yes. Given your moving account of what you went through as a teenager, and given the context in which it happens in a capitalist society that accumulated most of its wealth by virtue of uh, genocide directed at Native Americans and the uh, kidnapping and enslaving of black people from Africa, do you think it is realistic for us to hope that a curriculum and all the other media in our societies could be uh, reconstituted so that young people will actually learn how and why the American empire came to be what it is and how and why someone like Donald Trump, for example, becomes president of our country and treats people of color the way he does. I realize this is a question I cannot answer. <laughs> um, I admit that. I would say if you can begin with a curriculum of one with the efforts, and this goes back to essentially what Viktor Frankl um, was uh, writing up in Man's Search for Meaning, and it's why I am so glad I had a Santa County Almanac Man's Search for Meeting, and A Heart is a Lonely Hunter together that summer. Um, to say that curriculum in public schools could easily be changed, that's, it, it's, nothing's gonna easily be changed. But I think 
the lives that we leave, the people that we touch. Uh, for those of us who are teachers, for those of us who volunteer with children, for those of us who have any connection um, with young people, but not just young people, but with anyone, uh, I think what would make a difference is being protest and essentially, I mean, being vocal and essentially protesting in ways that aren't just marching with signs, but in showing protest by how you live, by example. Uh, and yes, I think in some localities, in some school systems, there definitely will be changes. Nationwide, that's a different thing. Uh, so I, if you think about it, um, let's go back a, um, a century and a half or before or earlier than a century and a half. I mean, of course, there was a civil war between 1861 and 1865, but there was so much that happened prior to that war from abolitionists and their efforts in many ways brought the, not just the situation of people enslaved and the inhumanity of it to a public light, but it also helped set the stage for others who decided to join the war effort to fight for this. So I am not calling, and please don't think I'm calling for a civil war, I'm not asking, no. But it's more that even in what seems to at some times feel hopeless, it's never hopeless. Because if it is, then might as well give up. And there's no way in hell I'm giving up, uh, no. No. So I, it's bit by bit. It's everything that you do. It's living a life with responsibility. It's being, uh, being essentially a model and also learning <coughs> from models all around you and working together and working together in ways that may be very different from what we're used to because we're facing uh, a political situation that in some ways harkens back to uh, a more distant past, but it's also very different as well. Um, there was there are two people. Do we have time? Yeah. Okay, two more. Okay, thank you. Good evening, and Good thank evening. you for being here. Just two points I want to make because the past two weeks have been very interesting on the subject of native indigenous people. I was at a screening of Awake, and that's, a, I don't know, remember the name of the tribe, but an ind indigenous person was there, and someone had asked him a question about Indians, and he said, that's Christopher Columbus. They're not Indians, okay? So that was one thing. They're indigenous people, and people say, the mu Museum of American Indian, mm, they were here before America, so he, just made those comments. The other one is today I attended a conference on multi multicultural education at SUNY New Paltz. It's an annual conference, it's mm -hmm. great. And people were talking about the language. So one of the students said, well, we're called different things. And we're talking about uh, Latinos or Hispanic. Names are made up for people. And they feel offended sometimes when people call them things that they're not. There was an interview with uh, someone who was, he said he was Latino, and the other person kept calling him Hispanic. Mm. And this person wasn't even listening. So a lot of times languages can do things too to people that are insulting and they don't realize it. So we call it, what, unconscious bias, because they call it the way that people usually talk and the way they feel that Somehow, this is how we've been addressing people all the time, and we just continue to do it because we don't really think about how that person feels. So I just wanted to make those comments because these two uh, meetings or conferences happened within the past week, and it's what we are talking about tonight, and other people are raising those questions. Thank you. Thank you very here. much for, for bringing it up. Um, language is very important, uh, and one of the chapters in the book focuses on, on language, using names on the land as a, a way into that. And part of that is considering how much of the language that is taken for granted is a language of imposition, a language that has been put there. 
um, without context, without taking into account the, the originators of those terms. And many people recognize that more than half the states are Native American terms, but that's not quite accurate. There, there are words that have been filtered through uh, European and Euro-American ears that have taken out of context very deeply important indigenous words and indigenous names that may have nothing to do what the original, with what the original meaning was. And names of people, it's the same thing. And names of mascots, et cetera. Uh, language is vitally important. And it's one of the often unseen elements. And because it's unseen, it's too often not recognized. But it needs to be, very much so. So thank you. That, that's really important. And by the way, while that's getting up there, I just want to thank you for asking such wonderful questions and for staying. I haven't looked at your book, but I can't imagine that you don't have some very interesting ideas about a phenomenon that is taking place right now and is fairly new, the lynching project. It's not, I don't talk about it or write about it specifically in here. In, no, okay. Yeah. What are your particular... Well, I'd like to know what you think. Oh, well, I think it's kind of a miracle that it's happening, a really good miracle in an otherwise kind of grim period. I traveled to the city where my mother lives. Where's that? Memphis, Tennessee. Ah. And there was a meeting of people, community leaders, black and white, faith-based people, I happen to know a young woman who's the daughter of a very good friend of mine, and she's an Episcopal priest at the cathedral in Memphis. And so there was a meeting in a Baptist church of all these people who were trying to participate and who were part of the, it's also, there's a museum in Montgomery, Alabama now that is mm -hmm. dedicated to this. About 4,400 people have been traced uh, who were lynched, some of them children. And this project is people throughout the areas where this happened, um, identifying them through probably the same methods you use to find mm -hmm. information about your family, um, meeting living descendants of those people, yeah. finding out their stories, memorializing them, and going to the places where they were lynched and having ceremonies, um, the museum takes those same kinds of memorials and turns them into museum uh, exhibitions. Uh, the one case they were talking about mostly was a small town in West Tennessee where they knew very well the name of a person who was lynched and where it happened. And they've been trying, and his family still lives there, but also the family of the man who led the vigilantes who uh, were responsible for this act, and they cannot convince the townspeople to put up a stone with this man's name and dates to commemorate where he was and honor the family. Uh, they're having a very hard time because the family of the original vigilante is also still in that town and they own a hardware store and they're leading lights. So I think that this is happening in many, many places. I may have said this earlier, but they've identified so far 4,400 mm -hmm. people who were lynched during there's, the Jim there's Crow period. There's more than that. Probably, yes. Much, much more than that. So what are your feelings about this effort? I, I applaud it because um, the, the victims of lynching uh, and lynching uh, effectively has occurred to our lifetimes. Uh, it's not something that ended in the 1920s or 1930s or was primarily in the 18. 80s or 90s after Reconstruction ended. It's very much something that still continues in some way. Uh, I applaud that, yet at the same time, I also hope people uh, understand that the, the sentiment behind some of the vigilantism uh, that led to lynching parties that were picnics 
where they took photos of the people being killed. And lynching isn't just hanging. Lynching is murdering often in a most awful way, including burning at a stake or at a tree. Um, and that there are some people who think that people of African descent still should be lynched. So the sensibility hasn't ended. Um, and that is also something that we need to bring to light and uh, work against. I was very struck that I had gone to school in this place for 10 years. I knew what the word meant. I don't remember any discussion of that entire period and the lynching in my history classes. I remember discussions of the Civil War, but not of actual lynchings. It seemed to me that it was being pushed to one side, and now the veils are being yeah. lifted. And lifting the veil is, is it. Um, it's one of those many inconvenient truths uh, that really need to be faced, and faced honestly, mm -hmm. um, and not defended as something that needed to be done uh, for the sake of security or uh, whatever reasons were given at the time. Um, well, as soon as I heard about this and attended the meeting, I suggest to anyone who wants to be fully shocked and educated to simply go to the Wikipedia page and you will read things that you never dreamed happened. Right. Well, thank you thank very you. much for that. And uh, I think we need to call it a day. So I want to thank Lorette. <laughs> thank you.